Welcome to the third annual Baltimore Festival of Jewish Literature, which showcases our community's love of reading, writing, and the written word. Hosted by organizations across the Baltimore area, the festival features a variety of virtual events, including panels, readings, and author discussions, and covers a wide range of topics, literary genres, and interests. Accessibility is a central value for our partnering organizations. Programs are welcome to all, and ticket prices and program fees are kept affordable. This is due largely to our sponsors. Thank you for your continued support. We're delighted to welcome you to our virtual studio and look forward to seeing you soon. I am Trillian Atwood, Director of Public Programs and Visitor Services at Jewish Museum of Maryland. I'm so excited today to be introducing our three inspiring authors who will be speaking as part of our presentation tonight, Ceiling Breakers and History Makers, The Legacy of Jewish Women and Justice. However, first a little housekeeping and a thank you to the entire team of partners behind the Festival of Jewish Literature, especially Melissa Seltzer with the JCC, who you'll be hearing from a little later, and Ed Berlin, without whose vision in the development of this festival, we wouldn't be coming together this evening. And so with that, now to our speakers. Elaine Weiss is a Baltimore-based journalist and author whose feature writing has been recognized with prizes from the Society of Professional Journalists. And her byline has appeared in many national publications, as well as reports for the National Public Radio. Her long form writing garnered a Pushcart Prize Editor's Choice Award and she is a proud McDowell Colony Fellow. And I believe a link to her website should be in the chat now. Marlene Tressman is a former special assistant to the Maryland Attorney General and former law instructor at Loyola University of Maryland's Selinger School of Business and Management. A New Orleans native, Tressman has a personal relationship with Bessie Margolin that grew from a common childhood experience. And again, her website can be found in chat now. And finally, Debbie Levy is the award-winning and New York Times best-selling author of more than 25 books for young people. Her most recent releases include the graphic novel style biography, Becoming RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's Journey to Justice, This Promise of Change, One Girl's Story and the Fight for School Equality, and We Shall Overcome, The Story of a Song. Debbie, uh, along with both Marlene and Elaine, uh, all live in Maryland. Uh, Debbie lives with her husband and they have two grown sons. And I believe again, yes, uh, you can find in the chat now a link to Debbie's website as well. And so with that, thank you very much. And Elaine, I hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Trillian. And it's a pleasure to be uh, at the festival again. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for the community to meet writers and for us to meet you. Of course, this year it's a little different, but I think we'll all be able to have a very satisfying conversation. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, I, I sort of wrote the, the book that chronologically comes before uh, those of Marlene and Debbie. I wrote about the women's suffrage movement. So my book takes place in Nashville, Tennessee in 1920. And it is the story of the last state to have to ratify the 19th Amendment, which will give the right to vote to half of the citizens of the nation who were not included when our founding fathers uh, created their government supposedly by and for the people. And so it's a story of what happens in Nashville, but it's also the story of all the women who came before and how this movement for equality begins in the mid 19th century when women have very, very few legal rights and how it um, expands and evolves and begins to uh, concentrate on getting the vote as the, the sort of turnkey for all the other rights that American women will need to live productive and equal lives under the law. So in many ways, the women I write about um, are paving the way for the women that Marlene and Debbie write about. They're very concerned with the law. They realize it's the law that can set women free. 
And so they go about trying to change the law, first with the tools that they have, like the right to petition, which uh, is not uh, segregated by sex uh, in our laws. And so they begin by petitioning Congress, petitioning state legislators. They go on to um, use the legal system to uh, uh, begin legal test cases uh, to the Supreme Court. And then they also try and finally succeed in getting an amendment to the US Constitution, which changes the law nationally to allow women to vote. Um, quite a few of the suffragists, uh, both in the movement and those I write about are, are Jewish women and Jewish men who do believe in a, that their faith is one where justice and equality is, is part of the ethos. And they talk about the idea of um, having a more just society and the 19th Amendment and women's suffrage is part of that. So I tell the story of what happens in Nashville. It's quite a wild tale. Um, uh, does feature some um, really interesting Jewish protagonists, uh, among others. And um, it's one that I feel is the, the basis out of which the women uh, like uh, Bessie Margolin and Ruth Bader Ginsburg can emerge once women um, have this basic equality under the law and have a voice in our government. So I'm going to hand it over to Marlene to uh, take the baton and bring us forward a few decades into Bessie Margolin's life. Thanks, Elaine. Yeah, it is. It's perfect in terms of uh, the book ending and, and the, the transition between the three women. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here too at the festival. So just to tell you, uh, mine is the least well-known, perhaps, of, of all the women we're going to talk about tonight. And uh, I'll just start this way. Before there was the notorious RBG of blessed memory, there was the audacious Bessie Margolin. And I wrote Fair Labor Lawyer to write her back into history. He and I shared childhood experiences, as you, as you heard, growing up in New Orleans, as we were both wards of the same Jewish Children's Welfare Agency, 50 years apart. And I got to know her during my years at Goucher College and law school. And as I started my career as a government lawyer here in the Maryland Attorney General's Office, Bessie's life spanned the 20th century from 1909 to 1996 was born in Brooklyn, New York, the daughter of Russian Jewish immigrants. From there, the family moved to Memphis, where Bessie's mother had a third child and shortly after died, leaving her father alone to care for three young children. He couldn't do it. He had his children admitted as so-called half-orphans to the Jewish Orphan Home of New Orleans, the first purpose-built Jewish orphanage in the nation. There, she learned powerful lessons in social justice that shaped her into one of the 20th century's most influential lawyers and probably the one you know the least about. Beginning in the 1930s, when women held only 2% of the spots as, a, as America's lawyers, Bessie used her rare law degrees from Tulane and Yale to make her mark on the biggest legal issues of her day with a pledge, if you can believe it, a real pledge that she would be married to her job instead of leaving. She was hired at the Tennessee Valley Authority, where she was the only woman on the brilliant legal team that kept FDR's New Deal alive. From there, she moved to the Labor Department, where she championed Frances Perkins' Fair Labor Standards Act. And in 1945, when little Ruth Bader was only 12, Bessie argued and won her first case at the Supreme Court. After World War II, drawn by new and exciting legal challenges, Bessie traveled to Nuremberg, where she drafted the rule for the Nazi war crimes trials um, and setting up the tribunals that meted out justice to the 200 and plus second tier Nazis, the doctors, the judges, and the industrialists. When she returned to the Labor Department, she resumed her position overseeing all of the Labor Department's trials and appeals. She argued a total of 24 times at the United States Supreme Court 
making her one of only three women of the 20th century to achieve that distinction, and to this day, one of only nine. She also championed the Equal Pay Act and was a founder of NOW, the National Organization of Women. She knew all about the feminine mystique and how to lean in long before those books were written. And lest you think she was all work and no play, think again, her penchant for passion our federal investigations that likely cost her the coveted federal judgeship she desired. At her gala retirement dinner in 1972, the likes of which Washington, D.C. had never before seen for a federal career employee or since, she passed at World War and then retired, honored Bessie by being her guest speaker. He praised Bessie Margolin for developing what he called the flesh and sinews around the bare bones of the Fair Labor Standards Act, without which he said the law would have been wholly inadequate. But then he paid her another compliment. He called her a great public servant and honored her by calling, by saying that she had proved equality of women in a man's world of law. Bessie Margolin opened courtroom doors for countless women, and we faded the court. I'll be happy to answer more questions. There's lots to talk about, but I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks, Elaine. All right, and now Debbie, uh, the baton goes to you and to uh, a woman who I uh, I think we um, have heard about. Thanks for the baton. <laughs> um, thanks for, for having me to all the people who've put on this festival. Um, I would really, I could just sit here and listen to the two of you and, and to the stories of the women that, that you've written about. But alas, I have a job to do here as well. I've written not one, but two books about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, both for children, um, although really I would say for children on up to adults. The first one is a picture book called I Dissent, Ruth Bader Ginsburg Makes Her Mark. It was published in 2016, just before that presidential election, and the book starts with this sentence. You could say that Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life has been one disagreement after another. <laughs> this book tells the story of, I'm gonna call her the glorious RBG rather than the notorious RBG, through the lens of her many disagreements with unfairness, with discrimination, with inequality. And the unifying theme in this book is that disagreeing does not make you disagreeable and that important change can happen one disagreement at a time. So why write this for kids? And you saw it is a picture book. Kids as I've gotten tweets and emails and seeing kids as young as four who are not reading this book by themselves but who are engaged in the book. Well, why give them Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Her lifetime of disagreeing resisting, persisting, not concurring, dissenting, all without trash talking or hurling invective is a great model for girls and boys and men and women. Don't say silent, don't stay silent, speak out, read, learn. When my editor and I were discussing uh, my proposal for this book back in 2015, we actually could not believe that someone hadn't already written something like it. The second book published in 2019, Becoming RBG, tells the story of an evolution. Step-by-step, -step, shy little Kiki Bader, her nickname as a girl was Kiki, becomes a child who questions unfairness, who becomes a student, who persists despite obstacles, who becomes a lawyer, who resists injustice, who becomes a judge, who reveres the rule of law, who becomes Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, hence the title Becoming RBG. Chosen before we knew there was going to be a great book by Michelle Obama simply called Becoming. This book is written in graphic novel style format. It's a mouthful, but as Justice Ginsburg said, and she always got to the point, oh, it's comics. Yes, it's a 200 page hardcover or paperback comic book. 
the book spends a lot of time on RBG's evolution as a feminist and on her career as a professor and an ACL lawyer. Because if there's one thing that I hope this book makes clear, it's this. Even if Ruth Bader Ginsburg had never become the first Jewish woman on the Supreme Court, she would still deserve a spot on the Mount Rushmore of great Americans for her role in the field of gender discrimination law. And one last thing that I'll mention, why write a book about Justice Ginsburg in graphic novel format? Well, I like to think I wasn't moved solely by her persona at that time, well, by that time in the, um, in the public eye as this sort of superhero, but it was there. Um, there were kids dressing up as RBG for dress as a superhero day at school, of course, Halloween costumes, people were dressing up their dogs as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, all with love and admiration, of course, teachers dressing up as Ruth Vader Ginsburg, people had a lot of fun with this. And I think she had a lot of fun uh, hearing about this. Um, but my point is that like the best superheroes, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had a great origin story, persevered in the face of mighty obstacles, changed the world for the better, and she partners with others along the way. So again, a great story for kids and for adults too. Elaine, I think you're gonna move us on. Thank you. Yeah, so I was thinking we, all three of us have written about women who in some way dissent, who see injustice in the world and devote their lives to um, uh, correcting that in, in, their, in whatever way they can. For suffragists, they become activists and that's both become part of a, a movement on the street and also part of a legal movement. They, oh, many, quite a few of them either become lawyers or become lawyers after the 19th Amendment. And so I just want to ask, do you think that, um, especially uh, the Jewish women we're writing about, that this comes out of their, their faith, out of their background, out of a sense of tikkun olam or a sense of standing up when no one else will stand up? I think backgrounds um, may propel them in the careers and in the choices they made. Marlene? Happy to talk about it. Um, you know, as I said, Bessie grew up in the Jewish orphan's home in New Orleans, and so she was surrounded by her face, faith. It would be hard not to be affected by it. And I'll sort of jump ahead. You know, she grew up as a very non-observant Jew, but a very proud Jew. Um, and definitely her faith and growing up as a reformed Jew in New Orleans affected her outlook. I mean, at the very least, the superintendent of the home in which there were at its maximum 170 children. This was no Dickensian enormous orphanage. It was a very small place. And the goal was to really raise these children in reform Judaism to both assimilate and to make sure that there was no anti-Semitism caused by um, Jews that were not protected and cared for but it was also to honor the religion and their benefactors. Um, the home also throughout Bessie's time was a venue for spiritual leaders and orators at their anniversary celebrations every year and throughout the year. Religious leaders would call during that time for a new type of philanthropy and a social justice. And it was the kind of philanthropy that was intended to root out and seek out root causes of poverty and, and in, injustices in the workplace and in housing and in, in health. So she was surrounded by this. And, and I believe, in, and I explain in the book in detail, the things that she heard and saw while she was there. Bessie's time in Nuremberg also, if she didn't understand the enormity of the situation for Jews before they got there, before she got there. And even if all she understood was that she was pursuing some new and exciting legal avenue, 
when she got there, her eyes were open. She talks about sitting in and watching the end of Justice Jackson's prosecution of the first trial of the 24 top Nazis and talked about the shocking, nauseating doctrines and crimes. And she wrote to a dear friend back home that she pledged while she was there to throw any little weight she could add to increasing the number of Nazis prosecuted for murder. So here was this you know, Jewish child born to Russian immigrants and, and she carried out that what she, what she had planned to. She also came in contact with people there who became lifelong friends. Morris Abram became a friend. He later became Brandeis University's president and the first president of the American Jewish Committee. Um, and then finally, even when Bessie did not put herself out in the world as a Jew, the world knew she was a Jew. And it affected her. She almost did, didn't get to go to Yale where she ended up getting her doctorate in law under William O. Douglas. The registrar asked Tulane's law dean who was recommending her, her position there, was she a Jew? And Tulane law's dean had gone to Yale and he knew that this could make or break her future. He acknowledged she was, but then in what I call a flourish of benign anti-Semitism, goes on to say that, <laughs> I wish to state that she has none of the characteristics that mark some of the people of that race as offensive. And then finally, when she was being considered for a federal judgeship in the White House, LBJ, President Johnson um, in conversations that took place over several weeks um, with his highest top aides, asked, what about this Jewish woman for the court of claims? And without further explanation, you can hear him on the tape say, isn't she a little dangerous for that? So Bessie's life was marked in many ways by being a Jew, first in terms of her pursuit of social justice, but second, as I said, even when she didn't put it out there, the world saw her that way. Oh, that's fascinating. Marlene. Debbie, any um, thoughts on how RBG handled this? Well, um, sure. I mean, first, let's, uh, let's acknowledge that she was an Olympic champion in the Jewish national sport, which you know is arguing. Um, <laughs> but more to the point of your question, Judaism was central to shaping RBG, and she was very open about this even as it delivered some disappointments to her. And in Becoming RBG, um, the book depicts the hurt and anger she felt when at the shiva for her dear mother, Celia, who died when Ruth was just 17, she could not be counted in the minion for the service because she was female, even though she had continued her Jewish education throughout high school and was really quite learned. But the book also shows how the teachings and ethos of Judaism shaped her. When she was all of 12, for example, after World War II had ended, um, and Bessie was presumably working at Nuremberg, and the world learned of the genocide in Europe, uh, young Kiki wrote an incredibly thoughtful article about the shock of it all for her synagogue's newsletter. And I, I, won't, I won't pull it out to read, but what stays with me is this eighth graders quotation of a famous writer's teaching, um, which is quote, prejudice saves us a painful trouble, the trouble of thinking, end quote. We know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg fully embraced that oh so Jewish painful trouble, the trouble of thinking. And as for the concept of tikkun olam, she herself drew the connection between that teaching and her life's work too frequently for, for us to count. Uh, but I wouldn't want it to claim too much. That is, I'm not sure I would assert that she was motivated in her career choice by the concept of tikkun olam. She was motivated by her mother with whom she was very close um, to be independent and to be able to support herself if she ever needed to. Uh, she came to understand when she was an undergraduate at Cornell while McCarthyism was sweeping the nation that lawyers could stand up for other people and make the world a better place. So there is that tikkun olamish thing going on there, but there's also this when she was at Cornell, 
before they got married, she and Marty Ginsburg decided that they would go into the same field. It was actually his idea. That way he said, we'll always have something to talk about. Well, Harvard Business School did not accept women at the time. Harvard Law School did. And so they both applied to and attended Harvard Law. So to conclude, yes, very tight connections between her Judaism and her work. Um, but let's, let's not too claim too much in, term of, in terms of motivation. That's, that's uh, you know, we have to be nuanced in our interpretations. Um, I want to ask another question, something that I encountered in my research on the suffrage movement, which was very controversial. I think we think of it these days as, oh yeah, I would have been a suffragist, absolutely, and everyone I knew would have been, and we would have been out there in the streets. And I'm not sure we realize how radical it was considered to proclaim yourself uh, much less to be out on the streets, much less to be picketing the White House and arrested and imprisoned. But there was, from the very beginning of, in the 19th century, there was a, a debate, a, a national debate, a debate in within uh, households of um, whether this was a good idea, whether women should have political equality and because suffrage was never just about um, legal uh, or voting rights, it was about what was women's role in society. That was the biggest debate, which is why it was so controversial and so, so difficult to resolve. And one of the things I came upon was that within Jewish families, uh, within each, uh, within the religion, with, within each, denomination, there were um, schisms. There were those who disagreed that this kind of equality was um, beneficial and should occur. And so you see rabbis um, dueling from the bima and um, disagreeing. It happened here in Baltimore. Um, some disagreed that women should get the vote and some were champions. And so um, did your, um, the women you write about face that sort of opposition and how did they answer that? They believed in these um, elements of, of justice and fairness and yet there were those in society and certainly those within their class who were going to disagree. Um, any example or any Thoughts on that? I mean, it was something that really struck me. There were two famous um, a Jewish family in, um, in New York um, and one woman is uh, the founder of Barnard College, believes in women's education, uh, Annie Nathan Meyer, but that women should have the vote. And her sister is a fierce suffragist. Um, so you don't want to think about what Seder was like. <laughs> but I'm just curious, um, did, you, did you encounter something like that in researching the women you write about? Marlene? Shall I go first? I'll go first. Sure, if you'd like. Okay. Um, you know, the interesting thing about Bessie is she got started um, and, and her real motivation for wanting to go to law school when asked just said, you know, I always had a thing for debating. I always liked it. So, um, you know, there, there is that to her as well. Bessie was very bright and a good student. And there was some part of her in the beginning, for many years, she just wanted to be a lawyer. She just wanted to be the best lawyer she could be. And I think it really was a problem for her to even have to come to grips with the fact that there were injustices among other women lawyers. Um, the, the best I can tell you about how she felt in 1938, she was asked to write an article for her AE5 sorority back when she was at Newcomb, uh, the magazine. She's already been out practicing. She's at the TVA. She's got her JD her, or her LLB from Tulane and her doctorate from Yale. And she writes to her fellow um, sorority sisters 
that the law was still too strict and too prejudiced against women. But she was very worried about women who were leaving the profession because not only was it bad because it meant that they weren't taking their places, but she understood that the prejudice against them and it was how difficult it was to try to manage to have a law career and a family. And so she had to take the route of never marrying. She had no children. Um, and she lived her life like a bachelor man would of the time. She played poker with the lawyers at all hours at the VA in Tennessee. She drove her Hudson Coupe through back roads and, and was undaunted by taking Pullman cars overnight by herself in the 30s. Um, she just did it. And I, it came as a real shock to her, literally, in 1963, when President Kennedy signed the Equal Pay Act. And by fluke, it was put into the Fair Labor Standards Act, over which she had supreme authority, other than the labor solicitor himself or the Secretary of Labor, over the cases that got prosecuted. She now had responsibility for the Equal Pay Act, something that she really had not thought much about because she was in fought tooth and nail to be in the higher echelons of law with men and was not encumbered by having only moderate, only um, um, reasonable equipment, as she called it. She had superior equipment, but boy, the convert is a zealot. And when she figured out what women of average equipment or like her with above average equipment were facing, she took it on. And she understood the kind of prejudice that women such as the founders of now were having. She used her government imprimatur to bring that status and that sense of reasonableness. And she talked about how she was a reluctant feminist. That was what she called herself, but that she was now one of them. Um, and she thought they were, she kept talking about how reasonable they were to sell them to try to minimize the radical nature that Betty Friedan and, and cohorts were perceived as ha having. And so Bessie was there to sort of reassure people that this, this top lawyer in, in government was, was bringing reasonableness. Everywhere she went, she was the first, she was the only. She was told as a young law student, she was taking the place of men who needed to put food and, and, and bread, food on the table and money as, as income. She was told by men in the Solicitor General's office after she had argued 10, 15 cases at the Supreme Court, ah, uh, anybody could win a Fair Labor Standards Act case at the Supreme Court. And for anyone who knows, no easy cases go to the Supreme Court. So Bessie had it every which way. I did not find in her papers, because of who she associated with, particular resistance from other women. In New Orleans, for example, she was touted by mothers to their daughters as someone that they should aspire to be. Um, but Bessie also learned to compartmentalize. If it didn't meet her vision of where women should be and where she saw herself, she simply didn't hear it except of course, when she was in court trying to win a case. So I think I've talked around your issue. Um, I hope I've gotten it somewhere. It's okay, no, no. But, but how they, they had to um, perceive this, this kind of opposition and handle it, Debbie? Elaine, you, um, Any yeah, you uh, briefly, you asked about, um, well, you mentioned schisms in families and, and in congregations and, mm -hmm. um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg never passed up the opportunity to credit her husband, Marty Ginsburg, for his support. It was extraordinary. Um, he thought she could do anything. And um, she had confidence enough, but he really built her confidence up even more when she was in college and then, and then in law school. And she credited him for letting her completely fulfill her potential. Um, so that was... Not everybody has, not everybody has that. And as for the rest of her family, her mother didn't live long enough to see her, to see the direction that she took. Uh, I have a feeling that Justice Ginsburg would have said, my mother would have been right there with me uh, and supporting me. 
And as for the rest of her family, who kind of, you know, her dad and the others who looked after her after her mom died, they were not sure that she should go to law school because of women lawyers, with how can there be such a thing? But then when she and Marty got engaged, what they said was, let her do it. If she fails, she's got a husband to take care of her. <laughs> yeah, you could see the traditional role that would be a, a comfort to them. Um, yeah, so Elaine, I, just wanna, no, I, I think we have time. Yeah. I was going to just. I was just going to say, um, I, I don't know if it's if schism is the right word, but Bessie learned early on that she was not about to be a wife and mother and couldn't at her time. I think one of the differences that, you know, there had been significant change for women between Bessie's generation and Ruth Bader Ginsburg's generation in terms of the opportunity for marriage and, and it not, it wasn't easy, but that it was possible. Um, and I'll just give the example that one of her, her I think her fiance, as I write in the book, um, she was engaged to a, a man in her law school class and he gave her the most endearing book of poetry. And it was just this love poetry. Well, by this point, Bessie, I think, has her eye on Yale and on bigger things. And do you know what she wrote in the margins on every page and around the side? She quoted extensive excerpts from Virginia Woolf's just published essay, A Room of One's Own, <laughs> which extolled the virtue oh. of women literally and, and you know, physically having space of their own. Uh, the romance ended and she never... <laughs> Never married. Oh, quite a story. Um, so um, each of us has written about some extraordinary women. Um, and one of the things I think Debbie's subject was already pretty well known. Certainly she was not the notorious RBG yet. She was just a, um, a very celebrated Supreme Court justice. But each of us, I think, uh, endeavored to, to bring these women into the public eye and to make them um, known and their stories to inspire a new, a new generation. Um, do you think that our, our little endeavors of, of bringing them out in books uh, can have a role? I mean, uh, Debbie is writing for young people uh, a very important age um, to, to be in them. And um, Marlene, you're writing for a, a, a broad audience and I'm writing for both um, uh, adults and then uh, a young uh, reader's edition of my book came out. And so what do you think writers can do to inspire a sense of activism and a sense of um, uh, responsibility uh, uh, for uh, for justice. Debbie, do you want to take that first? We'll switch it up. We, of course, we can tell the stories of the people who worked and continue to work um, to make the world a better place, not only for themselves, but for others. Um, but at least in writing for children, which is what I do, I, I like to take somebody like RBG and other people who I consider heroes and, and make sure to let kids know the following things. Um, her life shows that you don't have to know exactly where you're going when you set out. She didn't. Her life shows that obstacles needn't be permanent. She had lots of obstacles, they weren't. Her life shows that if one road is closed to you, you can find others. I mean, uh, I'm sure some people who are listening tonight remember her dissent in the Lily Ledbetter, Ledbetter case, when she was a justice already, um, the equal pay case that the majority rejected. She wrote one of her best dissents and spurred Congress to change the law. So if you can't go under it, go over it. Mm -hmm. And I want kids to know that you can't be great at everything. And in both of my books, it's very clear that Ruth Bader Ginsburg wasn't great at everything, including things she wished she could be great at, like singing. 
Um, but life offers the possibility of all kinds of surprises and, and opportunities. So um, that, that's how, that's what I want to do. Not only look at these people, they did amazing things. You'll never do anything like that because they were too amazing. No, they were also just people. And, 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 yeah. and so you can emulate them. It's realistic. Great. And Marlene, we just have a couple of minutes. How would you uh, address that? Um, I think what I was trying to do, obviously, was to write Bessie into history. And what I would recommend and encourage people to do, and I've done this at conferences of women judges, societies for legal history, there are so many unsung heroes in all of our lives that I encourage people to take out the tape recorder or the iPhone or whatever and get stories from people. I am so sorry I didn't have a tape recorder or know to ask, know enough to ask Bessie all the things when she was alive that once I became her reluctant biographer, I wish I had. So that that's sort of the first lesson is let's write people, especially women and people who have gone unsung back into history. Um, and I guess the second, the lessons that I see people learning from Bessie are so important today. One is the, the dignity of the law and the beauty of the law and the elegance of when the system works. The Congress passes the law and it gets enforced by executive agencies. And when there's a dispute, it can be uh, changed and tinkered. And, and so there's that beauty, but there's also the beauty and dignity of government employees and lawyers who day in and day out, and especially lawyers who zealously enforce the law and, and represent their clients ethically and to the limits of the law and with the spirit of the law. Um, there's, there's all sorts of lessons. And if Bessie's life isn't one set of hurdles after another to be overcome, that I think is inspiring to many, um, then I'm not sure what the story is about. So in addition to just making sure that, you know, not so many people just give me a quizzical look, I would love for Bessie Margolin to be a recognized name, at least among law students and labor lawyers. We're, we're getting there. Um, but I think it, it holds such meaning for women, um, for women lawyers, and uh, for people at large. And she was a good mentor. She really, once she pushed a door open, she held it open for others. And that's the other real important lesson of being champions and not even just mentors for others, but to stick your neck out and give people the kinds of opportunities that I was given, that she was given, so that people can realize their potential. Wonderful. All right. Well, I think we have had just too much fun uh, amongst ourselves, and we're going to open it up and uh, have some questions. Sure. On behalf of the Baltimore Festival of Jewish Literature and all the partner organizations, I just want to thank you um, for helping this vision of um, this program come alive. And so thank you for sharing this with our community. The first question comes to us from Carol Sandler who wants to know which rabbis opposed women being able to vote? She wants names. Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Can give you a name. Um, I do have the name of uh, Baltimore rabbi, but uh, I think I'll, I'll hold off on that one. I'll give you, um, in New York, there were two very famous rabbis. One, was um, Rabbi um, Stephen Wise, who was famous in social justice issues uh, for, for many, many, many years. And he was a staunch supporter of women's right to vote. And he actually uh, not only just supported it uh, from his BIMA, but he wrote about it, he was a fundraiser for the suffragists and would be at Madison, uh, you know, Carnegie Hall or Madison Square Garden at fundraisers. He even produced a, um, a little uh, Victrola record. Uh, this is before radio and this is how you would get cut a, uh, like a 45 um, uh, record and people could play it on their wind up Victrola. 
And he, and you can actually get this, and he supports women's suffrage. His nemesis is the rabbi of um, Temple Emmanuel in New York, Rabbi Silverstein, who is dead set against um, the idea of women voting. And for years, they battle from the Bema. It becomes pretty personal. And they, they also uh, battle to get the um, attention and recognition of the Board of Rabbis. Um, to, and Wise is trying to get them to support this idea of women voting and uh, Silverstein trying to get them to nix it. And, um, and uh, Rabbi Wise talks about the Jewish tradition, that this is something, uh, this is justice, this is democracy, this is why we live in America. Uh, we should be careful um, to not, to think that a democracy can exist when citizens are denied the right to vote, something we should remember today. And I, and then you have Rabbi Silverstein saying, oh no, shalom bayit, you're going to have arguments between um, uh, husbands and wives. They're going to be divorces because they're going to disagree about who to vote for, which he had a point, um, but he, he argues on Jewish law um, that this is a bad idea. So it's, it's really fascinating debate. It gets pretty hot and it gets uh, quite personal. And it, it is mirrored in, in Baltimore too. Okay, thank, thank you. And I know um, you touched a little bit on this, Marlene, but we've spent so much time tonight speaking about these wonderful women um, in the law profession. And I know that we have some lawyers on our panel as well. And um, we're here for the Baltimore Festival of Jewish Literature too. So I want to um, ask about your um, journey to getting to be an author and also what advice you would give to young women who are interested in writing. The best advice I ever got was just start writing. There is no I want to mm -hmm. be a writer. In fact, I was complaining to Debbie before we got started. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. At, when I gave up my law practice because I had a book contract, it was, oh my goodness, what have I done? Um, but these were stories I felt compelled to tell. And I think that writers are born from a need to tell a story, fiction or fact. Um, and so and you just got to write. Um, I will say that one of the big hurdles for me was coming from a very vibrant and robust collegial office, which seems so weird in the pandemic to remember that. Coming home, writing is a very solitary experience. And so I had to find the kind of camaraderie and collegiality in writing that I had as a lawyer. And I was starting from scratch. I didn't have a history degree. It wasn't like I could just show up at conferences and expect to be accepted and welcomed. I sort of had to start over. And my recommendation is for anyone who's interested in a particular type of writing, seek out others. Um, and to this day, I am so grateful. And sometimes I pinch myself that they let me in. But there was, if you can believe it, a group of amazing scholars, mostly women, but not all, a feminist legal biography workshop. And I was invited. I, I'm, you know, I'm not, um, I can put my ego aside. It wasn't me. I was carrying Bessie's briefcase. And so because my subject was understood by these women in the know, I was invited to sit and kibitz and, you know, criticize and critique and support each other. Barbara Babcock, who was the first tenured law professor at Stanford, was writing an important biography of a, a California legal pioneer and uh, Jane DeHart writing a biography of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and um, another Leandra Zarnow on Bella Abzug and Panina Blahav on Golda Meir. And so being in the company of these people who could critique and I could ask stupid questions um, was incredible. So networking and being and letting people see if you, you may think it's terrible, but just get it on paper and shove it out in the world. And what happen is somebody will tell you it's as bad as you think it is. And you just, it gets better. So 
I'll stop there. But I'm it can be done. <laughs> Elaine, can you answer that same question? Sure. Well, I, I, I come to it a little differently. I've been a writer, professional writer, all of my adult life. I was a journalist here. I was editor at Warfields Magazine. I worked for probably every publication in Baltimore. Um, and uh, when I pivoted to writing uh, narrative nonfiction, narrative history, which is over a decade ago, um, I did have some of the skills. But like Marlene, I was used to working in an office or with colleagues or very closely with an editor and, and working on a book is a different animal. It is, it is lonely. Um, it is, I have to just say that during the pandemic, except for curbing my ability to travel, my time at the desk is like it's always been. I'm, I'm used to working alone. I'm used to not going out to lunch. I'm used to that. Um, so it, you do have to kind of think of your own personality and whether you have the, uh, the desire to spend that time alone because you have to have your own thoughts on the page. Um, the research for me was a real joy. I have to um, deal with a lot of primary material, uh, a lot of um, uh, newspaper articles, which again, I love doing. So in some ways it brings together my experience and my skills um, and I, you know, sometimes um, I try to describe what I do writing narrative history as journalism with dead people, um, because uh, basically I am hearing their voices, not perhaps uh, orally, but through their letters, uh, through their, their uh, memoirs, through their documents and through what other people said about them. So for me, it's a, it was a sort of natural progression. Um, and of course, the great joy has been since the book came out, I've been touring or I was touring around the country. Now I'm zooming around the country and uh, talking to audiences and talking to my readers and meeting them. And, and that's very fulfilling too. So um, I agree with Marlene, it is a lonely profession, uh, but you, you must be driven by the need to tell these stories. Thank you. And Debbie, if you can answer that same question, and then we're gonna, um, we have one more question that I wanna get to, and, um, and then we'll, we'll conclude. So uh, when Marlene answered and began with something like, write, 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 you know, just write. What I, sure, yes, agreed, and um, when people ask me about getting started in writing for children, young people, I say, read, read, read because um, children's books have, have a, a tenor, they have a rhythm to them, they, they are different. Um, and it's not obvious uh, what works, but it becomes more evident what works and as importantly, what you like as a writer, if you read and if you read broadly in children's literature, I would not recommend just writing a children's book without doing that work first, because you'll be disappointed um, uh, in not, not because we all need to write the same type of children's books, but because there are issues in children's books that there may not be in writing for adults of language, of page turnability, especially when you're writing Apparently there's a phone in my room that's going off, pardon me. Um, especially uh, when you're writing a picture book. Uh, so read what you want, um, write. And then as for the loneliness, um, it is there, although I think if you're going to be a writer, you're already inclined to be comfortable with yourself sitting inside a lot and definitely reach out to other writers. If you want to write about children's books, the first thing you should do, or write children's books, the first thing you should do is join something called SCBWI. Write it down and go look it up. Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Let's get to that uh, question from, from our audience. Yeah, so we have um, a question from Sarah Jane G, who has a question for Marlene. 
and she wants to know if women law students and or women lawyers in general know about Bessie. More do now, but still not enough. And uh, one of the nice things uh, when the book first came out is a copy was purchased by most law libraries across the country. Um, so at least it's there. But that's been my goal to try to get people to know. And, and labor law historians don't always know about her. There were a few people who are historians of the Supreme Court but they basically had one or two sentences they knew and those weren't exactly right either. So no, she, she really was unsung. She was the lone woman in almost every room. People around her all have their oral histories recorded and placed in libraries. And if she was asked, she turned them down, but I don't think she was asked. Thank you. Now, it's also true that um, the legal profession didn't know much about the 19th Amendment either, and uh, found it quite interesting and astounding uh, to learn of all the, the twists and turns and difficulties. And so I, too, have spoken to, to many legal organizations, and, you know, the American Bar Association, the um, just the Ninth Circuit, the Eighth Circuit, um, and they are all uh, very surprised and almost shocked uh, uh, by the story I tell. And so clearly the story was not even known to legal scholars, though this is a, a, a legal story. And so I found that very, very interesting. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague Tracy Diamond at the Enoch Pratt Library, who um, partnering on the Baltimore Festival of Jewish Literature with us, and she's gonna close us out. Yes, thank you so much, Melissa. And as she said, I'm Tracy Diamond from the Enoch Pratt Free Library. And just on behalf of all of us from the Baltimore Festival of Jewish Literature, thank you, Marlene, Debbie, and Elaine for such an excellent and fascinating evening. Um, and I also would like to remind people that you can purchase um, all three books um, on sale until Friday at 2 p.m. through the Gordon Center, and that supports the Ivy Bookshop. And then, of course, anytime you buy any of their books from the Ivy, you're supporting them forever. Um, and I'll also remind everyone about um, upcoming programs that close out the festival. On Sunday, March 14th at 4 p.m., we have I Descent, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg sand art project and convo for tweens. On Sunday, March 14th at 5 p.m., we're in conversation with Joy Layden at the Jewish Museum of Maryland. And then on Tuesday, March 23rd at 7 p.m., we have Writers Live, Curtis Sittenfeld, and she'll be in conversation with Jane Delory. So we have an excellent month um, and of course an excellent evening tonight. So just thank you again, Marlene, Debbie and Elaine. And of course, all of the links for everything I mentioned um, are in the chat. So you can just click on them so you can learn more um, as we're closing out the Zoom tonight. And so thank you everyone and have a great <laughs> rest of your evening.